It's the greatest wildlife spectacle on Earth. Jean Duplessis follows the wildebeest migration through the Serengeti. So there's a birth about to happen. She's right here in this group. The wildebeests have given birth. Now they head back north to face the crossing of the treacherous Mara River. There's a huge crocodile in the river. A croc of this size only needs one decent meal once a year. Jean aims to time his arrival perfectly. There's another very large group that's also pushing onto the river. But when and where they'll cross is anyone's guess. There are no timetables for these nomads of the Serengeti. The Serengeti is one of the oldest intact ecosystems on Earth. It covers an area nearly the size of Belgium and spans two countries, Tanzania in the south and Kenya in the north. The ecosystem has evolved over millions of years. Every living thing here, from the tiniest insect to the largest creature, plays a very specific part in keeping it balanced. The most important driver of this system is the wildebeest migration. And the mechanism that triggers them to move is the weather. Sometime around October, thunderclouds build on the horizon and the rains begin to move south, signaling the start of one of the greatest mass movements of animals on the planet. It begins with the actions of a single animal, then, driven by an ancient instinct, the rest of the herd follows. It's a dangerous journey where predators wait along the route and prey on the passing herds. And then there's the treacherous crossing of the Mara River, where wildebeest will die in the thousands. Wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis has been tracking the herds. The wildebeest have completed the first trek of their year-long journey. They've arrived on the short grass plains, where the females have begun to give birth in what is the largest mass birth of mammals on the planet. We just passed a female with her leg sticking out of her, so there's a birth about to happen. Yeah, she found a flat patch and she's just kind of circling around. She's chosen the safety of the herd to give birth for obvious reasons. You know, inas, lions, and all kinds of predators are out on the prowl this time of the morning. And they are keeping a watchful eye out for something just like this. Yeah, it's gonna happen any moment now. There you go, she just stood back up. And yeah, that's, that's like, having gravity help her, but then there the baby drops. It's incredible, she's just coming around, sniffing on the baby now. It's amazing how quickly this all happens. Yeah, it's about five to 10 minutes now, and uh, the baby is starting to move around a bit more, and you know, it's, it's kind of trying to stand up, pushing it up on its hind legs, but very off balance still. You know, this, this, this young guy will be ready to go in the next five minutes. There you go, a new generation starting all over. In a few months time, this baby would even be strong enough to, to start up the migration up north and by July, August, even cross the Mara River. It's incredible to think that that little thing just, just born there, so, so helpless, in six months' time will be crossing huge rivers full of crocodiles that's like 12, 13 feet long. You know, and besides that, of course, 
they also have to travel 400 kilometers to get there through Ahina and lion infested savannah. Less than 10 minutes after it's born, the baby is on its feet. This is where the baby will imprint on its mother. They will get to know one another's scent and call. This is just the start of the wildebeest's mass births. 200,000 calves will be born over the coming weeks. It's an extremely smart, adaptive strategy. On these open plains, the newborns are easy prey to the predators that follow the migration. So by flooding the market with so many newborns at once, tilts the odds in the wildebeest's favor. Some will be taken, but many more will survive. There are huge challenges ahead for the newborn wildebeests. In two months' time, the calves will be ready to join their mothers on the return trip up north. But this first 24 hours is crucial for its survival. But with so many newborns today, the first day is a trying time. This is a little water hole outside of camp, and uh, this is some of the only standing water in the area. And these animals uh, found it, and um, yeah, great delight. A bit of disturbance. For many of these young wildebeest that was born this morning or last night, this would be the first time that they are drinking. And there's a little bit of pandemonium as uh, the wildebeest start to run around. They, they lose their mothers. And um, there's a few of them just standing around. There's this one here in the grass that clearly lost its mom. And um, a few of the adult females have been coming around just smelling it and showing a little bit of concern. I mean, this poor thing must have been born this morning early and to already lose your mom. Yeah. Some interest. And there's a second baby. It's also coming up now, even younger. That one is tiny. You can still see the umbilical cord hanging down. You can see there's a few mothers coming up smelling um, some of these lost babies and they would immediately push them away once they realize that that's not their calf. Well, wildebeest is very much like bats or flamingos where every uh, calf have a particular frequency that the mother zones in on. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, very, it's, it's not uncommon for babies to get lost, but they generally find each other. Luckily for this calf, its mother responds to its cries, and the two are reunited. The pair head off with the baby sticking closer by this time. Wildlife expert and safari guide John Duplessis is in the central Serengeti following the year-long wildebeest migration. It's February, the midway point on the migration route. Jean is on the short grass plains in the south, observing the mass births. The wildebeest females all give birth at the same time. Hundreds of thousands of calves are born in a two to three week period. For a species constantly on the move, this is an excellent survival strategy. The newborns are vulnerable to the predators that follow the migration. The only safety is in numbers. So the female wildebeests have timed their births to flood the market. Some will fall to predators, but with so many young, the odds are in the wildebeest's favor. For the newborns, life starts quickly. The calves are up and running within 10 minutes of being born. The first 24 hours is crucial for these newborns. This is when they bond with their mothers. But in a massive herd, the little ones often get lost. Jean has found a calf wandering along a main road, alone. I just came across a baby wildebeest that's obviously lost. And what happens is they, they basically imprint on anything. So he saw this vehicle driving fairly close to him. He came running up to it. And at this stage of their lives, they are, you know, they're so dependent on, on a, a bigger creature taking care of them, you know, hopefully being the mom, that uh, even if I get out of the car, it will come right up to me. Kind of hope for some king. Kind of quite sad. The baby heads off over the plains in search of its mother. 
Luckily, it chooses the direction that takes it back to the protection of the herd. And that's a good thing. Just up the road, Jean finds a predator. I just came upon a cheetah. She's down in a crouching position. It looks to me like she's hunting. She's, uh, she's looking at, at I mean, either like wildebeest. There's quite a few of them around. Um, but there's also like four or five Thompson's gazelles here that, that she's more than likely after. And also seems like these, these Thompson's gazelle are moving towards her, but also still not looking at her. There she goes. She couldn't make up her mind which one to go after, and it's so important for cheetahs to focus on one gazelle and just stick behind that. And then it seemed like she was going between the two different groups, and she, she didn't uh, get lucky on this one. The cheetah has missed its prey. It's too hot now for another attempt, so it retreats and will look for any shade it can find. She's now walking back to her cubs, which seems to be the only shade in the area. It's actually a safari vehicle that's parked behind us. It was also witnessing this. And the cubs are lying under the vehicle, and she's on the way there as well. There's no lunch for them, but the cubs seem fine with that. Now they have more time to play. So the mom just came to this vehicle to join her cubs. This is uh, the only shade around, and um, they need to improvise, and uh, they are really having a good time lying under the vehicle. There's, uh, there's three cubs here, and uh, extremely playful, and uh, obviously enjoying the, the new tires that's in this vehicle and giving it a good chew. <laughs> these guys are gonna be stuck here for a while. I'm trying to... Uh, Make sure that none of these cubs come and lie down under our car, because the moment they get under your car, you ain't going anywhere. And these cheetahs are pretty much down for the rest of the day, so I hope these guys have lunch with them. Or maybe they will be lunch. <laughs> the tourists will have to stay put until the cheetahs decide to move which will most likely mean a few more hours until the temperature starts to cool and the cheetahs head off to find dinner. The wildebeest herds will spend the next few months in the short grass plains, feeding on the rich grasses and nurturing their young. But soon the rains will start moving north, signaling the herds that it's time to get going again. The wildebeest migration is not just a defining piece of life on the Serengeti. It is also a key driver of the ecosystem. Over the course of the year, the millions of wildebeests drastically affect the landscape. The animals graze on the grasses like a giant team of lawnmowers, allowing new shoots to grow and keeping the plains healthy. With millions of wildebeests, there's a lot of waste. Some of that dung fertilizes the grass, which in turn helps it to grow for the next time the animals pass. But there is so much dung that nature has developed other solutions to make sure the plains are not overwhelmed. On the Serengeti, an army of its smallest residents go to work. We just came upon this great dung beetle making a, a dung ball out of some zebra droppings. It's incredible to actually watch the whole thing happen from the beginning, where this beetle has almost cut out this ball and then selecting this really good pieces of dung to uh, complete the ball. And it's using these spade-like legs to pat it down and make it round. What it's gonna do now is we'll start to roll it. And the idea about the rolling is to now cover it in soil making a really solid casing that will eventually protect the egg and then later on the, the larvae that's going to be inside this wet pile of dung. Ah, there we go, there we go. Quite amazing. Look at that. 
the thing is like 10 times the size of this, this dung beetle. And it's, uh, it's moving it. It's not only going to move it, it's going to push it quite a considerable distance. And the idea about the distance pushing is now to cover this wet mud with this soil. Insect life is crucial to the ecosystem and true to the Serengeti's epic nature. Even the small creatures do things in big ways. Scattered throughout Africa are impressive structures built of mud and clay. These are termite mounds. Their architects, although tiny, have a huge role to play. With 2.5 million mammals in the migration, one would think that nothing can really outcompete them when it comes to the amount of grass that's consumed. But the true champions are, in fact, these little guys. Within a termite mound, there's no sexes. Theoretically, they are all sterile females, but they are categorized in classes. And what I see here are lots of different individuals doing different functions. There's some bringing up the mud, building the mound, then there's others that will be collecting dead plant materials. But then there's these big guys, the soldiers, who would just be walking around and um, they're constantly tapping their heads. It's like a signal. And I'm sure they're a little bit disturbed with me being here. And that's a signal that they're giving that there is some threat close by. And their sole purpose will be to defend all these smaller ones, which are completely helpless. These harvested termites don't actually carry the dead plant material in the mandibles, but they would swallow it and regurgitate it when they get back into the mound. These plants then act as a substrate for fungi to grow in. That is what these termites eat. That's also the, one of the main reasons for these chimneys, is that it creates an air conditioning system that maintains a constant temperature within the mound of about 26, 27 degrees Celsius, and it's just a perfect environment for, for fungi to grow. These harvester termites eat enormous amounts of grass and plant material. Their eating habits and the placement of these mounds changes soil textures. In Africa, there's lots of different types of mounds that one can find, and the bulk of the mound goes down, and if I look down into these, chimneys, it is at least eight feet down that the actual air vent goes. Of course, these termites are not actually living inside the air vents. They've got no problem with other creatures making use of such a safe environment. This mount have a hive of African honeybees living inside here. I can constantly see them coming and going. But even more interesting is there's some sort of predator living in here, a small predator that uh, predominantly feed off something like uh, millipedes, because I can see a lot of millipede shells lying around, and, um, and there's even a dead bird inside. This is just such a fantastic entire ecosystem. Short grass plains in the south of the Serengeti are beginning to dry out. The rains are moving north. As always, the wildebeest instinct compels them to follow. Instinct tells them the rains will lead them to better grazing land. The babies have survived their first three months and are getting stronger. They need to because in just two months' time, they will face the greatest challenge of their lives their first crossing of the crocodile-infested Mara River. Wildlife expert and safari guide Jean Duplessis has been checking in with the herds at various points on their annual route. Along the way, he's taking time to explore some of the dynamic relationships in the Serengeti's ecosystem. The Serengeti is one of the few unspoiled places on the planet. This makes it a perfect place to see how an ecosystem evolves to support a variety of species. Everything from a blade of grass to the predators and the giants of Africa all play their roles and they're all interconnected. Remove one and the whole ecosystem can be thrown out of balance. The savanna elephant is a large animal, 
and its impact on this ecosystem is equally large. Elephants are bulk feeders and eat a lot of foliage. So their role in this symbiotic system is to maintain the savanna and woodlands by reducing tree density and keeping the forest from overrunning the grass plains. Some species flourish by developing a survival mechanism that draws some and repels others. Trees develop nutritious leaves or tasty fruit to encourage animals to eat. The animals then move on and deposit seeds from the trees in a new location, in a fresh pile of fertilizer. But too much of a good thing can be bad for the trees, so they have also evolved ways of keeping browsers like elephant and giraffe from eating too much. This is an acacia tortillus, and this is one of the most common trees in the Serengeti. And what's interesting is that it's also one of the most nutritious leaves, and probably the tree of choice for something like a giraffe. In the rest of the world, there's over 800 different species of acacia. Most of the acacia species have not got thorns, and um, they completely evolved in Africa as a form of protection against these massive browsers. But Still, the giraffe managed to find a way to get past these thorns with a prehensile tongue that can really go in between these thorns and completely strip off these little leaves. And um, giraffes are highly efficient, so they are obviously getting what they need to live out on these sometimes very barren plains. Another interesting thing about these acacias are that they've got these tiny, tiny little leaves. And the main reason is to allow maximum sun to reach the leaf, but to avoid it losing too much moisture, making it possible for this tree to survive in such dry and arid environments. Even something as routine as one species having a bath can have benefits for another species in an ecosystem that's evolved in an interconnected way. This is central Serengeti where there's water all year round. And we just came upon a nice breeding group of elephants that came down for their morning drink. And um, there's huge excitement between some of the adolescents as they go down into the river and uh, having a good old swim and a nice wash. In a balanced ecosystem, even something as routine as a bath can have benefits for a number of species. As the elephants splash in play, they widen the wallow, which means it can hold more water. It also creates more access so other animals can come to drink. There's one elephant here that's having a good old scratch. This is a good way of getting rid of ticks, you know, with a, with a kind of mud, it's a little bit of like a body paint that uh, scratches off all the ticks. He's coming out now. It's really important for elephants to get to water on a fairly regular basis. Their skins are about double the size as it seems and it's all kind of wrinkled up. And by rolling around in mud and water like this, a lot of water gets trapped in these folds and um, that will actually keep them cool when they're out on the plains that are extremely hot during the middle of the day. Look at a nice female. But I think she didn't like me calling her a female. They had the most incredible wash and play and rub, you know, it's like a massive spa that they found here. This would be a very popular little water hole in such hot, dry climates as right now. I heard one of these older cows make a, a, what we call a tummy rumble as watch one of their communication signals and that's generally a sign that they want some kind of movement. I'm sure one of these, these two here are probably the matriarch and she's in charge of this little breeding group and uh, she probably feels like she had enough now and it's time to move on. And these uh, younger ones does not seem in the mood to be moving on. As the central Serengeti enters its dry season and streams and rivers disappear, these wallows will become refuges for another one of Africa's great species.
Behind me is the Orangi River, and this is one of many seasonal rivers in the Serengeti. The catchment area for this river is coming off the short grass plains, and it only feeds into this river during the rain season. Right here is a little bit of a dammed area where obviously hippos are having a great time. And uh, it's, it's quite a popular tourist stop where one can have easy access to such great herds of hippos. Unfortunately for these guys, as it gets drier and drier, all of this water will eventually dry up. And that can be quite catastrophic for hippos in extreme dry seasons. Uh, Fortunately, hippos do have a little bit of a backup system that can give them a few more days when it's completely dry. They uh, release their own type of sunscreen that's referred to as blood sweat, and that will turn a hippo red and will give them another two, three, maybe up to five days to survive, hopefully waiting for rain to arrive. These, these hippos can have a bit of a tough time during certain times of the year, which is very different to hippos up in the northern Serengeti, living in the Mara River, that's got a year-round supply of water. It's July in the Serengeti, and the wildebeests have begun their migration back up north towards Kenya. The newborns are getting stronger each day. They'll need that strength. In a few weeks' time, they will face their biggest challenge of their lives, the crossing of the treacherous Mara River. Wildlife expert and safari guide John Duplessis has been tracking the herd since they began their journey nine months ago. So the migration is heading north at the moment. It seems like it's split up into two groups, one group going west uh, and another group going east. Now, the problem is that the group going east is heading into the Serengeti Wilderness Zone that's inaccessible to us. And the group heading west are heading into private game reserves where we also cannot go into. Um, so our only hope is to reconnect with this group as they are heading the northern Serengeti and maybe get together again and form one of these huge mega herds. For Jean, the good news is that the wildebeest will be moving very fast and for good reason. They're moving through the woodlands and the wildebeest feel vulnerable here. Lions and other predators have lots of cover, which gives them a great advantage when it comes to hunting wildebeest. The central part of the Serengeti is entering its dry season. As the rains move north, the rivers and streams begin to recede, leaving only small pockets of water. This affects different species in different ways. These small pools of water become gathering places for animals to drink and cool off. And that makes a perfect place for predators like lions to find their next meal. I just drove over the small bridge and there's a, a male lion lying on the side of this river. This is the, the kind of the beginning of the uh, Grumeti River. And um, they've killed a zebra and they've eaten quite a bit. They are really thick. It seems like he's going to pull this back to the shade. What probably happened here is these zebras came down to drink and um, these males ambushed them. It looks like fairly young males, you know, their, their manes are not completely full yet. So it's quite hard for these males to make a kill. So this is a perfect place for these males to be lying up, waiting for these zebras to come down and drink. And that's more than likely what happened. And he's gonna, he's trying to um, kind of pull this back into the shade now, but it's so hot and he needs to decide where he's going to preserve his energy. 
There's actually a big croc in the river as well that's eyeing up that carcass. It, that lion is giving a roar, and you also see this crocodile opening his mouth and probably hissing back at the lion. This is that. It's quite amazing seeing something like this. Crocodiles have evolved to live in water, where they are fast and agile hunters. They're not really designed to attack on land. When the rivers dry up, the crocs lose most of their predatory advantage, and they have to become scavengers if they want to eat. Nothing of this animal will go to waste. There is always another species that will line up to take over when another is done. The lion is so stuffed, his belly is stretched, but even still, he is reluctant to concede defeat and leave his prize to the croc. The lion retreats. Backing off was a good decision for the young lion. Even on land and out of its element, a croc is a formidable foe. It has the strongest bite force in the animal kingdom, at least three times that of a lion. While the crocodiles in this little river do what they can to get a meal, their brothers in the Mara River are in their element and getting ready for their annual feast. This is the Mara River, and this is the last major obstacle that these newborns will have to contend with. But not only do they need to cross this river and potentially choose a bad crossing place and die in the thousands, they also need to navigate themselves around monster crocodiles that's lying here waiting for an entire year for this very crossing. <laughs> There's a huge crocodile in the river. What's extremely interesting about crocodiles in general are that they are cold-blooded, so they don't need to eat food on a daily basis to keep their body temperatures warm. A croc of this size only needs one decent meal once a year. These huge Nile crocodiles are probably our best look into what massive dinosaurs look like. They have stayed unchanged since the dinosaur era and probably the best example of something that's so custom designed to, to the way they live. And they, they didn't need to evolve much since those early days. You know, they, they can completely submerge themselves with only their nostrils and their eyes above the water and still even then it just looks like four pebbles that's, that, that's in the river and get right in close to make effective kills. For us to experience crocodiles making a kill, it's very important to be here the moment these first herds of wildebeest will arrive at the riverbanks and start crossing, because that's when a crocodile will more than likely make a kill. It's now August, and soon the wildebeest herds will be back at the Mara River. This is where Jean started to track the herd almost a year ago. The journey has covered 10 months, and it is almost at an end. The Mara River is the lifeblood of the Northern Serengeti ecosystem. It spans two countries, beginning in the highlands of Southern Kenya snaking its way across the Tanzanian border and emptying into Lake Victoria. Its constant flows divides the park into two. The wildebeest are headed to open grasslands on the opposite side of the river where they'll spend the next three months. I'm on my way to try and find uh, these, the, the front end of the migration. And um, this time of year, they already should have been 
kind of all over the, the northern part of Serengeti, but I'm just driving hill after hill and plane after plane, and there's absolutely nothing out here. And uh, it's a little bit disheartening, you know, to just uh, not see a thing around. Um, uh, an entire industry is dependent upon the migration that was supposed to be here already about a month ago. And for some reason, it seems that they have flanked to the north and a little bit to the west of this uh, very crucial uh, northern Serengeti or called Cockatender area. As the week progresses, there is still no sign of the wildebeest. Jean has no choice but to wait them out. The herds were last seen heading out of the Serengeti National Park into private land where even wildlife experts like Jean are not allowed. Where and when the wildebeest will re-enter the park is anyone's guess. The reason for the delay is the lack of rain. The wildebeest herds follow the rain, but no rain means the grasses, which should be lush and green, are still dry and brown. Soon, storm clouds begin to build on the horizon fueled by moisture from nearby Lake Victoria. Little by little, they grow into massive thunderclouds until they burst in a torrent of rain. These short, intense storms crisscross the northern Serengeti and head towards the grasslands north of the Mara River. takes a few days of rain to give life to the land, and before long, the area is green with new grass. All that's left now is for the wildebeest to come. So I arrived in the area a little bit early. The, the migration is yet to arrive, but um, there were some big thunder showers last night, and that generally will pull in the herds. So there's not much more to do but to sit and wait here, and uh, I can imagine worse places to wait than here in the Serengeti. And with the rains, the wildebeest begin to move. Now the question is, where will they show up? The next morning, Jean gets out at first light in search of the advancing herds he knows will be coming. In front of me is where we saw that storm last night and an area in front of us is called Bologonja, and behind me is Cockatende. And I suspect to find the big herds just over this rise. Uh, but the big concern is that if they just go slightly east, they can go into Kenya and cross the river in the Masai Mara, which is on the Kenyan side, meaning that the entire northern Tanzania is going to miss out on seeing a migration and river crossings this season. Kenya is actually just a couple of kilometers over that way, but to reach that, we have to go all the way back to Arusha, and that's about a two-day journey to then get into the Masai Mara. So I really hope that the animals that, that's potentially in front of us is gonna swing west and come a little bit down river and do have a couple of crossings down on the Tanzania side. But John doesn't have to wait long. Just over the next rise, he finds that the wildebeest have arrived. There are so many animals, they dominate the plains and surrounding hills. We just crossed a little stream and all of these wildebeest are coming down to drink. It's about midday, very hot. So there are thousands around. They are moving towards the Mara River to make the crossing. Now the question is, where will they cross? Will they head into Kenya or will they stay in Tanzania? A male shows interest in a passing female. It will soon be the annual rut when the wildebeest will mate again. For now, though, they have a river to cross. 
So we just came over a hill and we hit the Mara River and there's a big group of wallabies that's starting to pack along the banks of the river. And this is normally a good sign of them wanting to cross. The general direction is to keep on going north. So these animals are definitely lining up for crossing. It might happen today, might happen tomorrow morning. I mean, the only way you're gonna see it is to hang around and wait. The wildebeest migration is one of the greatest spectacles in the animal kingdom. They spend their lives almost constantly on the move in a circle that takes them around the Serengeti. It's August and they are heading back north. One obstacle remains, the crossing of the crocodile infested Mara River. So we just came over a hill and we hit the Mara River and there's a big group of wallabies that's starting to pack along the banks of the river. And this is normally a good sign of them wanting to cross. It might happen today, might happen tomorrow morning. I mean, the only way you're gonna see it is to hang around and wait. Jean will keep following the herds. It was six months ago that the young wildebeest were born. This river crossing is a major event for adult wildebeests who have done this before. But this is the first time that the little ones have ever seen or experienced this river. Evolution has timed the birth so that the newborns have had enough time to develop their strength and coordination before they encounter the river. Yeah, this group in front of me is probably about two to three thousand and counting, but uh, off to the north there's another group of a couple of thousand. It seems like they, are, they, they would see these guys running and they're on their way here, but then down to the south there's another very large group that's also pushing onto the river. So I think I'm in the best position now to kind of scout all the areas and we'll see where it starts to happen and then make a choice from there. Jean has timed his arrival perfectly. The second column of wildebeest advancing up the western side has now broken out of the wilderness zone and into Kagatende. They are heading straight towards him. It is shaping up to be a mega crossing. In spite of the presence of thousands of wildebeest on the shores, the crocodiles lie still. Crossing point after crossing point is passed up as the lead animals assess their chances of survival. Finally, they choose. And a single animal descends, unleashing a waterfall of wildebeest behind. These animals don't plan to wait. They are ready to cross. The first wildebeest jumps, followed by its yearling. The others follow in behind them. Within seconds, hundreds of animals begin to snake their way across the river. The crocs are drawn to the commotion. So these wildebeest have been crossing the whole morning and there's two or three huge crocodiles that's making their way in the line of wildebeest crossing. get into position as the wildebeest struggle to get up the other side. Having seen the crocs, the rest of the herd stops crossing. Two crocs take aim on a yearling, but luckily the animal finds ground below the water and is able to outmaneuver them. They quickly scramble up the far bank to safety. One of the crocs has caught a wildebeest.
towards the end of the crossing, there was this enormous croc that um, got hold of a yearling that was struggling to get up the rocks, and it pulled it down, and then the second crocodile came in and literally just took the entire head of this wildebeest in his, head, in his mouth, and all of them submerged, and that's the last we ever saw of all of them. With too many crocs to contend with, the wildebeest have moved on to a new crossing point just downriver. probably the last 20 minutes, a constant stream of animals just streaming through the river. I would estimate about now 10,000 animals at least have crossed in front of us. The wildebeest live out their entire life cycle as a tribe of nomads on the Serengeti Plains. Constantly on the move, stopping only briefly before they follow the rains again in search of the next green pasture. They have evolved as great sustainers of the plains, caretakers of the land, and also food for the predators along the way. It's a naturally evolved, perfectly balanced ecosystem with every blade of grass, every creature on land, and bird in the sky playing its part in this continuous cycle of life on the Serengeti Plains. This is it. This migration of wildebeest and zebra are one of the last remaining mega migrations of the planet. And what makes this so successful is the fact that the Serengeti has been kept intact for so many years. The wildebeest crossed over into Kenya, and this is the completion of that circle where they would eventually, in a couple of months, start to be pulled down back into central Serengeti because of thunder showers that start up that way. 